So what makes a good reference control? As I mentioned, the reference controls are absolutely very important to get successful on mixing. And if you have terrible reference controls, then you will get terrible on mixing. So there are five rules that you should follow to make your reference controls. They are pretty much the same as making um, compensation controls for a conventional flow cytometry experiment, but the Aurora is much less forgiving, and so you really need to follow these rules. Number one, you should have positive and negative populations that are very clearly separated. And then to go along with that, rule number two is that the positive signal intensity of the control must be as bright or brighter than the multicolor sample. So I have here the same floor four, but we have a dim signature on the left and a bright signature on the right. So if your positive and negative populations are not very clearly separated, meaning that your positive is pretty dim, then you could get a sort of incomplete signature. Um, and so it's really better if you can get a really bright, separate, positive population to give the algorithm the most information to do the unmixing. Um, and then you can also imagine that if your reference control looks like this dim signal, but in your sample you actually have a much brighter signature that looks like this, the algorithm is going to have a hard time on mixing because, again, this dim signature is not providing the same information. Whereas if you use the bright signature as your reference control, then it will know that this is just a dimmer version of the reference control and it will be able to unmix it properly. Rule number three is that your negative and positive particles must have identical autofluorescence properties. So if your positive particles are compensation beads, then your negative particles also have to be compensation beads. They can't be cells. Um, so that should seem pretty obvious, but another one example that is maybe not quite so obvious is if you're staining blood, for example, with CD14, which stains all of your monocytes, um, then if you were just going to use the negative population within that tube, you would have the positive population coming from monocytes, and the negative population would be mostly from lymphocytes and granulocytes. And those cell types have different autofluorescence properties. So really what you would want to use as your negative population is another monocyte population. So I just want you to be aware of this, but you shouldn't have to worry too much because this can be pretty easily remedied in the software. You can utilize a universal negative, which means that it will pull the negative control from an unstained sample. So if I set it up like that, then I'll have unstained monocytes as my negative, and that will match perfectly with my CD14 positive monocytes for my positive. Um, so just be aware that these autofluorescence properties should be matching, and I guess to better explain why they need to be matching, um, just to further explain how the algorithm works. So we have the positive population, and you can see the spectrum looks something like that. The negative population then looks like this, so our cells have a little bit of autofluorescence in the violet channels, which is fairly standard. Um, and so what it's going to do is it's going to take the positive signature and subtract the negative signature from it, and then you're going to get your normalized average reference control signature. So if your autofluorescence properties are different, then it's going to subtract out a signal that isn't in the positive signature, and therefore your reference control won't be very accurate. Uh, to that point, if you are using compensation beads, then please don't be lazy like I am and just add in the antibody and don't wash them. 
you're definitely going to want to wash your compensation beads because if you don't wash them, you'll have some excess antibodies stuck to the negative beads and you'll be able to pick that up in the background. So you wanna make sure that your negative populations, if you're using the, the population that is, in within, that is within the same tube as your positive population, you wanna make sure that this negative is clean and doesn't have any signal that's similar to your positive population. You just want a clean autofluorescence background. So you may need to check an unstained sample to see what the expected autofluorescence signature should look like. Rule number four, reference controls need to have sufficient events in both the positive and negative populations. So for the software to calculate the unmixing, you need a minimum of 200 events in both of those gates. So if you have fewer than 200 events, then the software will not let you move forward. And most likely you'll need to restain a reference control or rerun a reference control or you may need to run the one that you have for longer to get more events. Probably the easiest way to run in this situation is for your live dead die reference control. If you have a really good sample prep and you don't actively kill some of your cells, then you may not have enough dead cells within your sample. And so you're either gonna need to run that sample for a really long time so that you get 200 events or as I mentioned, you can actually actively make your own control that contains dead cells in it. Um, another way to explain the reasoning for this is this, this signature is an average of all of the cells. So we're looking at an individual signature for each of these 200 plus cells. And each signature is going to be ever so slightly different. And if we take the MFI of these, you know, we'll get an average signature for all of them. And so in order to get the most accurate and the best average signature, we need to have enough events. So we can get a decent average from 200 events, but if we were to say have 2000 events, then the average would be much more accurate. And then rule number five is probably the most important of all of the rules. The fluorescence spectrum of the positive control needs to be exactly identical to the one in the multicolor sample. So an important thing to pay attention to is whether or not your fluorophor is a tandem dye or not. The tandem dyes should be pretty obvious to pick up on. Most of them have a dash in the name, so PE Psi 7, APC Psi 7, PE Dazzle, etc. Um, if you're using a tandem dye, you must use the exact same antibody and even the exact same lot because when they're creating these tandem dyes, the chemistry isn't very specific. So there is no chemistry to say, I want to place exactly 10 Psi 7 molecules on every single PE molecule. So every time they do these conjugations, there may be very slight variations and slight variations could mean slight changes in this spectra and therefore unmixing errors, which you don't want. So for tandem dyes, you have to use the exact same antibody, exact same lot for your sample and your control. Now on the flip side, if you don't have a tandem dye, so all the basic dyes like PE, APCE, BB421, you can potentially use a different antibody for the same fluorophore. So if you have a really rare population, it's really hard to get enough positive events, then I would recommend if it's not on a tandem dye, you could swap that out for something that's easier to stain like a CD3 or a CD4 antibody, and it should still unmix just fine. Another thing to note is that you cannot use equivalent fluorophores. So I know that sometimes people do this in conventional flow cytometry, but the Aurora is very, very unforgiving. So if you're staining for GFP or you have a GFP mouse, then you cannot use Fitzy as your control. It will not unmix properly. Uh, if you have a live dead aqua dye, you can't use BV510 for the control. So make sure that you use the exact same dye. You can't use equivalent fluorophores. Those aren't going to work. And another thing to consider is, especially if you're doing a lineage or dump channel, 
and you're using tandem dies, then you need to be cautious of how you approach that because again, the tandem dies could have slightly different signatures. So if you're going to have multiple antibodies with the same fluorophore, if they're not a tandem, then you can probably get by with just having all primary antibodies, so five different PE antibodies, and that should be okay. But if you're using tandem dyes, then you probably want to use the biotin streptavidin combo. So you would get biotin related lineage antibodies and then come in with a streptavidin um, secondary antibody so that all of your lineage antibodies have the same tandem fluorophore attached to them. And then the last consideration is fixed perm buffers. So these can potentially alter the spectra of a fluorophore. Particularly the fixative is what does it. So you want to make sure that you treat your controls the same as your sample. So if you're putting a fixed perm buffer on your sample, then you need to put that on your controls as well. Even if it doesn't make sense, if you're using compensation beads, you're going to want to expose those fluorophores to the same buffers so that the signature looks the same. Um, I do recommend if you are going to do fixed perm buffers or fixative, anything like that, um, you may want to do some extra troubleshooting and try out the fluorophores with and without the fixative, and you may need to do some extra troubleshooting for the unmixing. Okay, so now for a little quiz. If we have this PE Dazzle antibody, which is for PDL1, if I stain cells with that and my multicolor sample is the same exact antibody, will that unmix correctly? Yes, it will because they're the same cells, the same antibody. It should work. Now, if we put this antibody instead on compensation beads, and try to unmix our sample. Will that work? Most likely yes. Um, we'll get into this a bit later on in the presentation about using compensation beads or cells, but for the most part it should probably work. Now let's say you want to stain FOXP3 and you're using BV750, but you switched your reference control to a CD4 that's got the same fluorophore on it. Will that unmix correctly? This one I tricked you a little bit, so I didn't tell you that the Brilliant Violets do have some tandem dyes that are a bit harder to figure out. So BV421, BV480, and BV510 are the only Brilliant Violet dyes that are not tandems. All the other fluorophores are tandem, so BV750 is a tandem dye, which means I need to use exactly the same antibody. I can't swap it out for a different antibody. Now, if we are staining a tetramer that's got PE on it, but that's a really rare population, so I've swapped the PE out for a CD4 antibody, will that work? Yes, it will, because this is not a tandem dye, so switching this antibody is just fine. And then finally, we've got this activation marker, CD69, on APC and we're staining some activated cells, whereas our reference control is unstimulated cells with that same antibody. Will that work? I would say most likely no, because your reference control is unstimulated, so the CD69 has probably increased on these activated cells, which would make your reference control dimmer than your multicolor sample, and that validates one of the rules. So a few tips for your reference controls. You may need to actually manufacture your reference controls for if you're using cells. So that may mean that you stimulate your cells or you may need to use a different tissue or a cell line that has better expression of the particular marker that you're interested in using. Um, I also do recommend that you manufacture your live dead control. So I would recommend killing some cells, and you can do that however you want. The way that I usually do it is I put the cells in an Eppendorf on a heat block at 65 degrees Celsius for about 10 minutes, and then after that sun, I just shove it in some ice. Um, SciTech usually recommends this fixable zombie near IR dye, so for that, you would want to stain your dead cells and then wash that dye away 
And then what I do is right before running the control on the instrument, I just spike in some unstained cells and that gives me the perfect reference control for the live dead. I've got a really bright dead population and then a great negative population. So now for the big debate, should you use compensation beads or should you use cells? So here's two examples. We've got the same APC antibody, this one stained on cells, and this one stained on beads. So you can see the beads do make a cleaner signature, and by cleaner I mean that um, essentially the peaks of the histogram are narrower when compared to on cells. Um, and it's a really bright signal on cells. You can see we're losing a little bit of the signal around B7. Um, so the compensation beads definitely give you a really great signature. But the problem is that beads are not cells and we found that we actually get some inaccurate unmixing when you use only compensation beads. So, for this experiment, SciTech wanted to see if the signature for 3 fluorophores 4 were the same on beads versus cells. And for some reason, when these two of these fluorophores bind to beads, they actually give a slightly different signature. And we don't fully understand why this is, and unfortunately there isn't a great way to predict why it may be, but you're going to have to test it out for all of your antibodies. So for this, they've just overlaid the signature. So if we back up, essentially we're just overlaying these two plots on top of each other, um, but there is no quick way to do it, unfortunately. So you have to export the MFI for each of these detectors, normalize it to the unstained population, and then you can graph them in whatever program you want. So the beads are in blue, the cells are in orange. You can see for this AF488 antibody, the signature is perfectly overlapping. So we could certainly use beads to unmix our cells and we would have no issues with the unmixing. It should look great. Um, for the BB711, you can see there is a portion of the signature that is a little bit different. And for Percy PE4710, there are several spots that are slightly different and how that actually looks in the data is if we use beads to unmix this sample, if we pick a region where the two signatures are perfectly overlapping, so something that peaks in this region, so they've picked BV605, if we put BV605 against the 711 dye, you can see that both the beads and the cells are perfectly unmixed. But if we pick a region where there is a greater mismatch, so R4, that is where APC R700 peaks. If we plot APC R700 versus BV711, then our beads are perfectly unmixed, but we have an unmixing error when we look at the cells. And the same is true with the other flora for per CP E4710. There's multiple regions, and so we're getting multiple unmixing errors. So something to definitely keep in mind. You don't necessarily need to do all of these overlays yourself. Um, you could just look at your sample and see where the unmixing errors occur and if there is one or a few fluorophores that seem to require a lot of fixing then try unmixing with cells instead of beads. Um, but if you want a precise way to do it, then you can certainly overlay the two signatures. So the answer is yes and no for using compensation beads. Um, if you only use compensation beads and you never ever use cells, then most likely you're going to find some unmixing errors. But obviously, if you use only cells and you have some dim markers in your panel, then that might be problematic problematic, especially if your cells have high autofluorescence. So here's an example of some unstained cells. So this is just the autofluorescence pattern of these cells. If we compare that to BV480, so if the autofluorescence is subtracted from the BV480 signature, you can see there isn't really much of a signature for these cells.
Whereas we compare that to the compensation beads and we're gonna get a very nice clean signature for what BV480 is supposed to look like. So obviously for dim markers, compensation beads can be a great option. So how do you remedy this? I would recommend that for your very first experiment with a brand new panel, you run a full set of cells and compensation beads for your reference controls. So double reference controls for one of your experiments for a brand new panel. So let's say you have a 10 marker panel plus your live dead. Your live dead, you'll have to stain it on cells. You won't be able to stain it on compensation beads. Um, so for this experiment, 11 colors, I would recommend running 10 tubes for compensation beads and 11 tubes for cells for all of your reference controls. So 21 reference controls. And then once you run the experiment, play around with the different comp combinations of unmixing. So usually I start out with unmixing on all beads because it's really easy to do that unmixing. And then you can check your cells to see how well it unmixed. And usually you can figure out a combination of using cells and beads to get you the best unmixing results. And then once you've determined what the best combination is, then you don't have to run this full double set of reference controls every single experiment. Most likely you can just get by with whatever combination you found works best. Now you may be wondering, does it matter what compensation beads that you use. I did do a test with two of the Thermo Fisher's beads. So I did the Ultra Comp beads and the ABC Total Antibody beads. Um, the Ultra Comp beads, the positive and negative is in the same vial, whereas the ABC Total beads, there's one vial for positive beads and one vial for negative beads. Um, stained these, tried to do unmixing. So ideally, this is what we're expecting because I mixed a bunch of single stains together. And long story short, the ultra comp beads seem to do a little bit better than the ABC total beads. So my recommendation would be to use the ultra comp beads, um, but obviously there's a lot of beads on the market and I have not tested all of them.